the examples that you're making uh, up, um, they're actually really, really important. When you have a finished proof, and, or, and you used an example to prove something, you're gonna get dinged on, in your proof writing classes. But they're very critical for developing those ideas. So in our class, I don't do that. If you can't get to the end, you're going to put under the line that I didn't understand this, but I can develop for you an example. I know why it's true. I think those are critical things. And same uh, Dr. Fuller, he also asked students about this example thing. Are they putting the examples down as proofs because they don't know that that's not a proof? Or it, are they putting it down for another reason? And the answer was they were putting it down for another reason. They, this was all they felt they could put down. And that's why they were putting it down. So they knew, those students knew that that wasn't the answer, but they felt it was the best they could do. See that there exist if there is n, that, that's a there exist. Anytime you have a there exist, you have to produce it. That's really, really important in advanced calculus where they say there exists a limit, you have to show it. Here it is, here's my limit. So in any case where you're showing A divides B, you have to show there exists that D. You have to produce it in your proof. So anytime you see that there exists, a little flag should go up. I'm going to have to actually produce it and give it to the, the professor who's the all-important person who grades my papers. <laughs> One of the most difficult things in writing proofs um, is not using the definition. So in many proof writing classes, you'll have professors um, give you a list of definitions that you have to verbatim write down. And um, as a whole, what we found at Montclair and elsewhere too, is that students don't put down the definitions exactly and they get really ticked off when they get either full points taken off or some points taken off. And um, the reason that we are really rigorous on the definitions is they are the nuts and bolts of the proof. And they have to be exactly worded. And the best way to get students to do that is say, I need a word for word. And to have you start substituting words in. And that's probably why they are very strict on that. I don't ask definitions. So I, I'm, I, I used to. So I, uh, I don't do that anymore. I ask you just to write the proof. So if you don't know the definitions, you can't write the proofs. So here, for example, um, I'm looking at four divides 12 and um, someone, let's say a student has written four times three is 12. That's not a, a, a demonstration of the definition. This is four divides 12 because there exists, there is an integer three such that four times three is 12. I've produced it, here's that integer. Just writing this is not enough. You're not conveying that information correctly. Where we talked about this already, that you have to fill in the details. So your other textbooks in your proof writing classes may look frustrating to you, um, but now you should have some insight of why they expect you to fill it in. And the higher up you go, the smaller they are. And the, they get really expensive then. I don't get, it, get that. <laughs> they leave out the de details, I do the writing in there, and then they charge me $200 for it. And we talked about this. Here's another thing I live by. This is not an exact quote, but I know that you two have heard me say this over and over again. You don't learn math, you just get used to it. Think about it. What's the math that you know the best? Math 100. The easy peasy algebra stuff, right? Because you've, been, you've seen it. How long have you seen it? You're so used to it. You're probably so used to it, it becomes difficult after a while to really explain why something's happening. How about long division? You're really used to that. How do you teach someone long division other than do this? Right? It gets harder and harder the more used to it you are. So that's really how we, ex we experience math and we get used to it. You probably haven't experienced proof writing as much. So it takes some time to get used to it. Used to it. So give yourself a little bit of time. Don't expect on the first day I'm gonna write all these proofs and write a paper on proofs. <laughs> So let's go to proofs. This is more about reading the text. How do you read the proofs? 
Underwood Dudley's not that bad, actually. I chose it because it's, it's not that bad of a book. Um, the, he has here a theorem. If D divides A and D divides B, then the conclusion is D divides the sum. Now think about that. Is that, is that true? Think about a few numbers. Two divides four. Two divides eight. Does two divide four plus eight? So run some numbers through the wash to see if it's true or not. In your own mind. You have to be convinced first before you're going to write a proof. And um, what's interesting is in his book, he doesn't have that much stuff written there. He just has a little bit, like this little piece right here. I, I just took a picture of it with my phone and put it up here so you can see it. So let's next make a list of things that are kind of annoying about this word. Um, so this is how I read the proofs in the book. I look at line by line and I try to figure out why they put different things here. So the first thing is they use the definition of D divides A. D divides A means there's an integer such that D times the integer is equal to A. My first flag is they did the same thing for B, but they didn't use the same letter. So I have a Q here, and I have a Q there. I don't have a Q there. So why did that happen? So I know why this is there. That's the definition, right? The, the A and the B from the previous definition, and I based instead of the D. So they have different letters, but it's the definition. So I get that. But all of a sudden here, they have an R. Where did R come from? Well, the question is, if I have two different groups of numbers, does the Q have to be the same in both of them? And the answer is no. I just made an example just to teach myself that these two letters have to be different. So I scrutinize every little piece that they're writing, and I ask myself, why? Why'd they write that? Why'd they do this? So that those two numbers are not the same. So now I can see, okay, they used a different letter there because these two numbers are not necessarily going to be the same. The Q and the R. So I ask these kind of questions on quizzes and the exams. I wanted you to see that. So sometimes I'll give you a fully written proof and ask you, why'd they do that? So the same questions I ask myself as I'm going through the proof in the book. Why'd they put an R there? Why they, can't they use Qs? Two Qs? Um, so uh, it just, and I'll ask for incomplete sentences and the rubric will be on the side. So you'll know. At least your book is little. You don't have much pages to go through <laughs> with all of this. What are you guys using for advanced calculus? The friendly approach thing? Yeah, that's, that's not too bad, I think. It's bigger like that. So how do you write your own proofs? Well, there's actually an algorithm. There's a, it's a secret algorithm. Nobody tells anybody else about it. And in class, you get to see finished proofs, polished proofs, with no idea of where they came from. And one day in graduate school, this German girl taught me how to do the proofs. And as soon as I learned it, I thought, I can't wait to teach this. I'm going to reveal this to everyone. Because why was this such a mystery for me for so long? And no one just told me this little algorithm. There is an algorithm. There is a process. You start with what's called the hypothesis. Um, every statement that you're going to prove can be posed as an if-then statement. So in between the if and the then, the words that are in between those two are called the hypothesis. And I've dumbed that down to no. It's just what we know. This is the piece that we're allowed to use. The second part is to take that no and expand it. It's like a, one of those little um, towels that's crunched up and you have to pour water on it and it gets fluffy. You have to expand it out like that. So what does it mean? You know, if they say A divides B, then you write, oh, from the definition A divides me, B means that there exists a D such that A, now I have an equation of something I can work with. So you, that's what I mean by expand. After that step, you write down what you have to show. That's all the words after the word then. You just splice it off, pick it up, 
input. That's called the conclusion. And you expand that and you write out all the definitions associated with that. That tells you where you're supposed to end up. And then you start from your no and you go to your show. You try to keep messing with the equations that you get after expanding the no and you arrive at the show. I actually have, I haven't posted this yet, but I have a um, proof writing guide where you can actually fill in blanks and fill out the whole thing. So I'm gonna prove something for you going through these steps so you can see how it's done. And I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do the messy version, that's a scratch, and the write-up version. I can easily stand here, well, especially with a PowerPoint, I could fill your mind up with one proof after the other that's all polished and ready to go. But I don't feel that really teaches you anything. Um, and I'm sure you've seen a lot of that already. So what I'd like to do is show you how this comes about and it's gonna get a little messy. And then we're gonna write the clean version, the version that no one's, that, that people are supposed to see. So there's always scratch work. The first step is to take the words between if and the then, and that's your no. So what's your no? Girl that's bored in the back. <laughs> D divides it, that's right. See how easy it is? That's your no. And what does that mean? Well, that's my show by the way. I can see that. That's a, those are the two easiest things to see. So we're gonna write what that no means. We're gonna take that D divides A. Well, I just go to the textbook. D divides A means that um, A can be expressed as D times some other letter for some integer. And I, I referenced it, page two. It's just like English writing classes. You have to reference everything, at least in the beginning. Yes, from the textbook or from the definition. You have to reference it. No, I mean, like, when you ask us to prove something, you don't No, that's completely know. useless. I'd hope 10 years from now you don't remember that this definition is on page two. Exactly. Watch, just because okay. I said that, you're going to remember it. You're going to come back to me 10 years later and say, I know what's on page two of Underwood Dudley, but I can't find my keys because that's taken the place in my head. <laughs> <laughs> don't blame me. <laughs> so I rewrote that so you can see that continuation. Check that this makes sense with numbers, at least in the beginning, as you go along with your scratch work, that anything you write down makes sense. Um, in your proof structure, how many of you had proof writing classes already? Advanced calculus, abstract algebra, and um, topology. Okay, so you've had some. So you've probably seen people write nonsense or something on the paper before. I've had that. Um, just check as you go along, back check, and make sure everything you're writing is logical and makes sense with numbers. There's, so I just checked, here's T, my, my integer, I just checked that it works. Now flush out again, I already know what I have to show, I, I underlined it, I ha and then write down what it means. D divides that blob, CA, means that CA can be expressed, you see me writing the definition down again and again? There, it's just verbatim the definition, the, the original definition with, with the A and the B, I have just the letters are changed, that's all. And I probably should have screenshotted the definition again on the side so you could see it, so. This is just good form to just write it. Um, it is writing, it does involve some writing. And um, I've learned the hard way that if you write these things out, you're gonna save yourself a lot of grief. Um, because when you write them out, you think you're wasting time, but you're not. I'm always done first. Because I have everything so organized, it just goes done. Um, so I just wrote this to demonstrate again what I have to show so I don't accidentally use it. That's a big no-no. Don't use what you have to show to show it. <laughs> Circular argument. Everybody asks me that. Why do I have to use a different letter? In the other page I used a T, here I'm using an S. They might not be the same. So when I use the definition again, I always have, it might end up being the same. But just to be on the safe side, when I rewrite the definition, I use a different letter. Again, you can try it out with some numbers. See, my T and S, it didn't turn out to be the same.
For those of you who are not sold on this idea of using the PowerPoint, look at that. This is what you would take down without the colors. This would be what your page would look like. And then you wouldn't know what came first. There was a bunch of arrows, Ted Williamson writing everywhere. You wouldn't know what it was. When I first taught, a student showed me their notebook and I thought, oh, that's what I'm writing on the board? <laughs> Just, you have no idea what they're transcribing. They're writing down everything that you're putting on the board. And it was horrid, it was horrible. We don't get any training. They just, you know, you just, I didn't get any teacher training. They just threw me in front of 45 students at Georgia Tech. And I made a mess of it. So I got my no one expo show expanded, there it is. I've got stuff I can get my hands on now, right? It's not words anymore. I can work with equations. That's where I start, that's where I have to end. So I, I can do this, and you can too. I need to come up with the S, right? That's how, what I have to show is I have to show the divisibility. That means I have to show there exists that integer. I have to produce that integer. Start with the no. So the no has an A in it. The show has a C A in it. There's no C's in the no. How do I get them in play? How do I take an equation and get a C involved? There you go. See, I told you, we can work with equations. This is the math that you really, really are used to. So I just hit both sides of this. What I love about the PowerPoint is that I can copy and paste the previous thing and put on the next, which I can't do on a plot board. And then I can simplify that. If you realized, um, I, I didn't transcribe the show, but I had CA is D times stuff, right? The stuff is supposed to be the S. That's where it's supposed to end up at. Well, C times T is just another integer, so I'm going to name that integer S. There it is. I've come up with S. It feels good. That's why people do math. It feels really good. I saw you guys. That's pretty nice. <laughs> See, that's what happens to you after this much math. You're in a little club. <laughs> it's a cool club. <laughs> <laughs> um, I went and uh, I told you I'm a technophile. I love it all. I went and just um, posted up on Facebook. What do you think are the biggest challenges um, for students writing proofs?